And welcome to Faith and Victory Church Online Wednesday night Bible study. Um, if you're just tuning in and joining us now, or you were waiting, or you did get a little bit, we had some technical issues. We rebooted and restarted, and we're coming up live now. Praise the Lord. Uh, yep, and it's now showing up. So go ahead and invite your friends to join us. Share the service. Praise the Lord. And um, let everybody know we're here. And, um, and very soon you will get to see us in live and in person on Wednesday nights. And, of course, for those that, that can't make it, we will continue to broadcast uh, streaming uh, videos so that you can join us in, in that event. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So, um, we are continuing with our series from E.W. Kenyon's book, The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption. We encourage you to buy that <coughs> and purchase it on Amazon for around $15.00. Um, we're on less than 18 of 37 and we're just moving into the good stuff now. Praise the Lord. The incarnation. Um, and we've through the study of God's word have come to the point now to the most, one the most exciting, um, event to take place since creation itself, the incarnation man's need of redemption required the incarnation man being spiritually dead, the child of Satan had no approach to God. Um, there were temporary fixes of the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, the covering of, of Adam and Eve with the uh, skins of animals, the sacrificial system, um, the, the priesthood. All these things were patches and fixes um, to keep man in a position where God could bring the incarnation. Hallelujah. This incarnation had to be the deity and humanity and would provide the substitute um, through a unity, a unification of God and man into one being. Uh, and the incarnate one could stand as man's redeemer. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, being equal with God on one hand, united with man on the other, he could bring the two together and thereby bridge the chasm between God and man. Hallelujah. And also because he was deity and humanity united, as a man he could assume the obligations and penalties of human treason, paying the price, satisfy the claims of justice so that the human race could be freed from the authority of, of Satan. You can read Hebrews 2 14, Colossians 1 13 and 14. And then man, because of this, the, uh, the uh, right to receive the nature of God was made available. Praise God. Hallelujah. I mean, this, you know, when you, you think of the centuries and the millennia of man suffering in the servitude of Satan, Without the hope of reconciliation, uh, only a promissory note, the Old Testament saints did not go to heaven. They weren't born again. They went into Abraham's bosom, the upper regions of Sheol, um, dividing between that a gulf and the, and then in the lower regions was the um, uh, place of suffering and um, torment. Remember, uh, the rich man went and lifted up his eyes, being in torment, see Lazarus, and Abraham's bosom afar off. Hallelujah. And um, it wasn't until Jesus went and preached cap, uh, to the captiv captives in captivity and brought them out. Hallelujah. And led that processional and then took his own blood in and redeem mankind, that mankind was able to go to heaven. All right. So the incarnate one could not be born of natural generation. It was not possible for God to come into a child who had been born through natural generation and make that one incarnation. Why? Because, because the word of God tells us that death had passed on from Adam to all men. And so, um, and this is the fallacy of the uh, immaculate conception. 
the teaching of the Immaculate Conception is that in order for Jesus to have been so, uh, born sinless, Mary had to be born sinless. And so she was the Immaculate Conception. When, you know, the, the doctrine in, in the church at Rome, the Immaculate Conception is not that Jesus was born sinless, it's that what Mary was. It is the basis of Mariology, which is fallacy. It is not accurate. Because then if that, that, law of, that line of thought is taken, you'll have to go back to Mary's parents and they would have had to have been sinless. And then their parents would have had to have been sinless. And their parents, we would have had an entire race, entire line of sinless, pure people in order to get to Mary so that Jesus could have been born sinless. It's, it's fallacy. No, the virgin received supernaturally the word of God and bore a son. His name was called Emmanuel. The, so I'm saying this very clearly. The Immaculate Conception is a false doctrine in the church. It is not, it is not biblical. You cannot carry the thought logically back because then you'd have, you, you, any one of those people could have redeemed mankind because they would have been out from under Satan's authority. So it just doesn't work with scripture. And, uh, you know, I know there are people who, who are really into Mary, but uh, Mary was a virgin who was conceived the son of God. But after that, she had other kids and she had to believe on Jesus herself. Praise the Lord. So I don't mind. Well, I do mind. I don't mind kicking sacred cows out the door. Um, I do that a lot. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, the Bible teaches us that, uh, by one man, death, the nature of Satan entered into the world and passed unto all men. And that by one man, the entire human race died spiritually and was ruled by this spiritual death. Mary had to be born again, just like everybody else. Romans 5, 12 says, therefore, as though through one man sin entered the world, so death passed upon all men. Romans 5, 18. So then, as though one trespassed, the judgment came unto all men to condemnation. If Jesus had to be born of natural generation and God would just enter into him, he would have been a child of Satan with God dwelling in him. This would not have been an incarnation. That utterly destroys the thought of the perfect incarnation of God. If on the other hand, God could have eradicated spiritual death from the spirit of one man and dwelt in him, making that one an incarnation. He could have changed the nature of the entire human race the same way. To do this would have been an injustice to Satan and an injustice to himself, for the sin problem had not been settled. The penalty of man's transgression had not been paid. The Redeemer must be one over whom Satan had no legal claim or authority. And this could only come by a redeemer being conceived and born as the babe of Bethlehem. In other words, a man had to pay the penalty for man's transgression. But that man had to be, that's why we have, um, uh, the typology of the priesthood and the sacrificial system. A blemishless lamb had to, had, had blood had to be shed spotless, pure. That blood had to be shed from a spotless, pure lamb. And so, um, th this is why this typology is given. Jesus had to be pure and spotless. Glory to God. Well, no man was, they were all born into sin. Paul says, I, you know, uh, I became a man, sin revived, and I died. God's first promise of the incarnation is given in his conversation with Satan right after Adam commits high treason, Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The Father God realized the need Man's need can only be met by the incarnation of his son. He realizes that incarnate one 
can only could not be born of natural generation. So he gives a prophecy that a woman shall give birth to a child independent of natural generation. And that is called the seed of the woman. Isaiah 7, 13 declares, and he said, Hear ye now, O house of, Israel, of David, it is a small thing for ye to weary men, that ye will weary my God also. Therefore the Lord will give you a sign, himself will give you a sign. Behold, the, vir the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now the NIV, the ASV, and many others um, use the uh, participle the instead of a, as the King, the King James uses a, but um, Kenyon is looking at other translations here and um, behold, the virgin shall conceive. And um, the child is going to be born of the house of David and the Lord himself will give a sign. Here, God uses the word Adonai, which meaning the God of miracles uh, himself, the God of miracles himself will show you a miracle and a wonder. Something out of the ordinary is going to take place. And we ask, what is it? And he says, the virgin, as though he had marked her out, shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Um, so a virgin was going to give birth to a son in a supernatural way. And she's going to call his name Emmanuel, God with us, or it's the incarnation. Taken connection, Luke 31 through 36, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son that shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great. He shall, he shall be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, she's talking um, King James for relationship with a man, marital relations. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come unto thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Wherefore also that holy thing which is begotten of thee shall be called the Son of God. And the child, you notice, is conceived of the Holy Spirit. It is a supernatural birth. She was the cousin of Joseph, who is also of the family of David. So the prophet exclaimed, O house of David, it is a small thing that you weary me. I will show you a sign. He's marking out this daughter of David, who's going to give birth to that wonderful being in a manger cradle in Bethlehem, 700 50 years later. In Jeremiah 31, 22, God declares, a woman shall encompass a man. More literally, a woman shall encompass a man child. Hallelujah. This incarnate one is not born of natural generation because man is fallen, and be, is a fallen being, and his seed is subject to Satan. This seed must be one is not subject of Satan. And so this wonderful being must be conceived of the Holy Spirit and the womb of the virgin is the is to be simply the receptacle of that Holy One until the day he's brought forth. I, Isaiah 42, 6 says, I, Jehovah, have called thee in righteousness and will lay and will hold thine hand and will form thee and give for thee a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Adam was created. The rest of the human race were generated by natural process. But this child is going to be born, is going to be formed by the special act of divine power. Paul speaks of the birth of Jesus this way in Philippians 2, 6 and 8 through 8, who existing in the form of God, counted not the being of an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men and being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, yea, the death of the cross. One translation says he, he, he um, stripped himself of all of his rights to deity and the glory. He didn't strip himself of deity, but of all his rights to it. Notice the terms. He had always existed in the form of God, 
but now he empties himself and takes the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men and found in fashion as a man. All these things suggest a separate and distinct operation of God, separate from natural generation. Here is a being with whom God performs a miracle, listen, by taking him out of the Godhead or from the Godhead in heaven and placing him in the womb of a virgin to be united with flesh by this unique conception. Paul writes it later and says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou didst prepare for me. Hebrews 11, 5. He was, God prepared for Jesus a body, a special body. And he used the womb of the virgin as the receptacle to that, for that to take place. Now, in, incarnation assumes and presumes this very fact. That the one that would become incarnate had a separate existence previous to coming to the earth. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he did? I'll get some hand claps out there on that one. 17 times in the Gospel of John, it is declared that Jesus was sent forth from the Father and came to the earth. And that he again left the earth and went to the Father. <clears throat> the entire Gospel of John is based upon the fact that Jesus had a previous existence with the Father and that while he was walking the earth, he remembered his experiences in the other world and spoke to the father of these experiences. And also when he would go back and take up again, life with the father. Look at John 17, three through five. And now father glorify thou me with the time, thine own self with the glory, which I had with thee before the world was. He, while he was facing crucifixion, Remembers the glory he had with the Father before the world was. And you can uh, also read John 3, 16, 8, 42, 13, 3, and 16, 28 through 30. Micah 5, 2 is a remarkable prophetic utterance of the preexistence of Christ and his coming to earth. Out of thee shall come, uh, one shall come forth unto me, that is the ruler, to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old from everlasting. Hallelujah. Well, who's, who's the king of Israel? Jesus. Here there's going to be one born of the family of Jacob to be the ruler in Israel. And his goings have been from old and from everlasting. He's traveled up and down through the eternities, left his footprints on the sands of ages of the ages. In John 1, 1, it says that in the beginning the, um, was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning, this being existed in the beginning, in eternity. The Word was with God. The Eternal One was with God. And with Him in fellowship and purpose, working with Him. Hebrews 1, 2 says, Through whom also, talking about Jesus, He made the worlds. <clears throat> John 1, 3 declares, All things were made but through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We saw in the very first lessons that the word God in Genesis 1, 1 is Elohim. A plural word revealing the Trinity at work in creation. This being who became incarnate that he might become man's redeemer, we behold at, during, and in effect doing creation. The word was with God. This eternal being who was in fellowship and companionship with God was God. Just as much as the Holy Spirit is God, the Son was God. He possessed, he possessed the same nature. He existed in the same form on an equality with God. Philippians 2.6. Remember, being equal with God, a thing to be grasped. In John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. This one this incarnate one, the second person of the Godhead became flesh. He became man and dwelt among us. He became human as much as though he had never been anything else, yet he did not cease 
to be what he had been. He made his home among us and we beheld his glory. He was the image of the invisible God according to Philippians, I mean Colossians 1.15. He was the exact representation of God's being, Rotherham declares in Hebrews 1.13, the Rotherham translation. From the time of the entrance of spiritual death into the world, unto his birth, God was working toward the incarnation and repeatedly gave promise of Christ's coming, ministry, death, and resurrection. And there's a list of scriptures here. You just, I mean, there's so many uh, of his sufferings, uh, of his death and burial, of his resurrection, of his ascension, of his future triumphs. There's about 25 scriptures here for you to go study, or what you could have already studied. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then scriptures concerning him as the Redeemer. Glory to God. This incarnation was an eternal unification. We note that Christ became man in the incarnation. He became man for eternity. He did not he assume humanity as a garment to be worn for 33 years and cast off and laid aside, but he became man to be a man forever. And today at the Father's right hand, there is a man in heaven as a result of the incarnation. 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timotheus, in what we would call a pastoral epistle, chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Kenyon uh, uses a variant and says, himself man, Christ Jesus. But here it is, right here. There was a mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He did not cease to be, why? Because now God has a covenant with him, and with, between God the Father and humanity in the man, Christ Jesus. Satan can never overthrow the authority of man because it's in Jesus Christ, who's conquered and defeated Satan. He took back Adam's authority, but put it in a place that Satan can't get to. Now, individual humans can reject that, but the one that has the authority is Jesus Christ. The, all men have access to Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. Now, folks out there watching on, on uh, virtual land, that is shouting grounds. I just want you to know. That is absolute Holy Ghost dancing and shouting grounds right there. Praise the Lord. Um, man in God's image. The fact that it was possible for deity and humanity to become united as one for, in one individual for eternity reveals the place first man had in the plan of the Father God. He created man in his image, just a shade lower than himself. Uh, Psalm 8, 5 says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast created him a little lower than the angels. Now, uh, I just think the King Jimmy translators just didn't have the guts to put there God because the word angels there is Elohim. The word they translated angels is Elohim, in which we know from Genesis being one of the names of God and manifest in the, the plurality of three or more, the Trinity. But what is man that thou art mindful of him? The author made him just a little lower than yourself, than myself. Just a shade off. Like Jerry Savelle said in a, a sermon I heard a preacher years ago, talking about, you know, he was a car guy, car worked on cars. He talked about replica cars. They look like everything, just, I mean, like the original, except they're not. They're, you know, man is a replica car of God. Hallelujah. Just a shade lower. We're not God, but he's made us in his image and his likeness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man has been created so nearly like God that it's possible for God and man to become eternally united in one individual. Now, if it's possible for God, that God and man become united, God can dwell in these human bodies of ours. God can impart his life and nature to our spirits and dwell in our bodies. If Jesus was an incarnation, then immortality is a fact. If we receive eternal life for our spirits, then we have the positive assurance that our bodies will become immortal at the return of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. If the incarnation is a fact, Christianity is supernatural, every man 
who has been born again is a part of the incarnation. In other words, we're the body of Christ, not outside. We're in Christ. Hallelujah. The believer is living as much of the incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth. That's why, because we are born again. We are the body of Christ, and that body is the incarnation. Um, God can now eradicate spiritual death from the spirit of man and give man his life, God's life, because the claims of justice have been met in Christ. A man accepted the penalty for Adam's high treason, and God judged it. But because Satan had taken an innocent man who had not sinned, he had no legal right nor claim to hold on to him. Even though he allowed and took the place and the penalty for it, on Satan's side, it was a breach of contract, as it were. And therefore, liberty was granted, and all men now have access to the eternal life that God imparts through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. We cannot conceive of anyone's desiring to doubt the incarnation. Is only is the only answer to the cry of the human heart for God. It is the only solution to the problems of sin, suffering, death, and disease. The incarnation proves the preexistence of Christ and is the foundation and reason for all subsequent miraculous manifestations of the, of the divine power. It is the basic beginning miracle of Christianity. Hallelujah. So, so we're getting into the good stuff now, folks. Glory to God. You know, this is when I wish I was in a church service where I had, had room to run. Glory to God. Kind of hard to run around the car table. Not enough room. Be like, I'd be like our, our blue tick coonhound when he comes on here. He takes two steps this way and two steps that way. And full blast. And he has to put on the brakes. Because if he goes any further, he'll knock half the furniture over. Hallelujah. Looking at our questions for tonight, hallelujah, why, could, uh, why couldn't the incarnate one be born of natural generation? If Jesus had been born of natural generation and God had simply come into him, he would have been a child of Satan with God dwelling in him. This would not have been an incarnation. As the, explain Isaiah 7, 14. Well, Isaiah 14, 7, 14 declares the virgin birth, that the seed must be um, of one who is not a subject of Satan. He must be conceived of the Holy Spirit, and the womb of the virgin is to simply be the receptacle of that Holy One. And what does Philippians 2, 6 through 8 reveal concerning the birth of Christ? These verses reveal that while Adam was created and all other men were born of natural generation, this one would be fashioned differently, supernaturally by God. Jesus always existed in the form of God, but would now empty himself and be fashioned as a bondservant in the likeness of men. And explain John 1, 14. This being became flesh. He became man and dwelt among us. He became human as much as though he had never been known anything else. And yet he did not cease to be who he had been, God. He made his home among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the God. He was the image of the invisible God. And we wanted to give several scriptures uh, revealing and showing the preexistence of Christ. And we have John 17, 3 through 5, 3, 16, 8, 42, 13, 3, 16, 28 through 30, John 1, 1, Micah 5, 2. Hallelujah. In what form did Christ exist before the incarnation? He existed in the form of God. And um, question seven, give a prophetical scripture on the following, the birth of Christ, Genesis 3.15, Isaiah 7.14, his death, Numbers 21.9, Psalm 16.10, 
22, 16, 31, 22, 49, 15, Isaiah 53, 8, 9, Daniel 9, 26. Now you can go back, once this is supposed to go back, and get these and, and pick those up if you need to. Um, scriptures of his resurrection, Psalm 9, uh, 17, 15, 49, 15, 73, 20, and Jonah 2, 1 through 10. And his being man's redeemer, Job 19, 25 through 27, Genesis 14, I mean, I'm sorry, Genesis 48, 16. Psalm, it cannot be Psalm 190. <laughs> I'll leave that one out. Uh, there's a typo there. I'm not sure which one it is. Hallelujah. Isaiah 41, 14, 43, 1, 44, 22, 59, 21, and, 22, 20, and 21, 62, 11, 63, 1 through 9, Jeremiah 50, 34, Genesis 22, 8, and Isaiah 53, 7. Probably Psalm 119, verse 14. Um, let me go look real quick. That's probably what that is. Um, every once in a while, if you've ever seen me in action, I get happy fingers on the keyboard. And um, I'll, I'll look up at the screen, and it'll look like I'm, I've wrote tongues all over the place. No, it's not Psalm 119, 14 either. Um, not really sure what it is. But that's okay. Praise the Lord. We'll look back at Psalm 19 and then that's it. We'll stop there if I don't see it there. See what I was trying to say. Nope. Forget it. Just forget that one from Psalms. I don't have the right scripture there. Hallelujah. Um, ver, uh, question eight. When Christ became a man, did he cease to be what he had been before? No. It's a real simple answer. No. Uh, and we want scripture that reveals the fact that we have a man at the right hand of God, 1 Timothy 2, 5. And what does the fact that it was possible for God be to become man reveal concerning the creation of man? It reveals the place the first man held in the plan of the Father God. He had created man in his own image, just a shade lower than himself. And that was his desire in the in, in, re, in redemption to restore us to our rightful place in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, thank you for being with us. Next week we'll continue with our teaching from the Bible of the Bible Redemption, Lesson 19. Um Glory to God. God is so good. It's time to give. If you have, if you're ready to use uh, Cash App or PayPal, you can go ahead. Um, PM me uh, if you want an address to ma mail offerings to. Um, we we will get that to you. I guess we can direct. Can you message the church? Message the church. Ask and we'll get it to you. That information to you. Uh, we'll just need your 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 name or phone number or texting or email. Some way we can co communicate back with you. Um, to get that, so you can, if you want to mail, uh, otherwise you can use our electronic online uh, methods. Praise God. And um, we just bless you as you give and tithe and sow to the kingdom of God. Thank you for your faithfulness to the kingdom, and we bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Looking forward to uh, being with you all again in person. Um, pretty sure that's going to at least happen by the last Sunday of this month, if not before. Um, Obviously, it's really looking like it won't be this weekend. So it's either this weekend, it'll either be the next weekend or the following for sure. Um, praise the Lord. Looking forward to seeing all of y'all in person. Sure love you. Appreciate you. We bless you. And we thank God for you. And we do give you this, this last thought from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. That whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church online.